Hi. Thank you for having me. Uh, I noticed last night that inbound 15 was trending worldwide on Twitter, which usually only happens when you've done something terrible. <laughs> I think the thing about Twitter is that it's a stage for these kind of constant artificial high dramas where everybody's either a magnificent hero or a sickening villain, and you don't seem like sickening villains, so you must be magnificent heroes. Um, anyway, I've got notes, but I'm going to try not to refer to them, but I probably will refer to them because I've got a terrible memory. I've got the worst memory. In fact, quite recently, my wife booked me as a special treat, a spa weekend, uh, which she should know is like a terrible special treat for me because she knows I don't like being touched. And anyway, when I was at the... Um, I was being massaged and it was awkward and uh, I was trying to make conversation with the masseur. So I, I, I told her about my terrible memory. I said, I've got a terrible memory. I don't remember anything about my childhood. It's all gone. And as she was massaging me, she said, well, most people who don't remember anything about their childhoods, when they recover their lost memories, it turns out that they were sexually abused. <laughs> so I said, well, I'd remember that. Anyway, I'm <laughs> going to talk about public shaming on Twitter, but I think, I, I, I suppose I, I was trying to remember when, what the genesis of this new book was, and I think it was actually a moment in a previous book of mine called The Psychopath Test. And in The Psychopath Test, I, I, I learnt how to become a professional psychopath spotter. I went on a course uh, to teach me how to spot psychopaths, uh, and I'm now a certified in that I have a certificate of attendance and also extremely adept psychopath spotter. Uh, so the statistic, by the way, is that one in our, this is according to Robert Hare, who's like the kind of father of psychopathy study. Uh, the statistic is that one in a hundred regular people is a psychopath. So there's how many people in this room right now? It's about 2,000 people in this room. So. 20 of you are psychopaths, um, so it could be carnage by lunchtime. Um, but that figure rises to 4% of CEOs and business leaders. You're four times more likely to have a psychopath at the top of the tree than at the bottom, according to, to Robert Hare. So I was wondering what I should do with my new psychopath spotting skills, and I thought I won't put them to philanthropic good, what I'll do instead is think about all the people in my past who had crossed me to see which of them I could out as psychopaths. Uh, so, top of the bill was a Sunday Times columnist called A.A. A. Gill, uh, who had written, just written a column about how he'd shot a baboon on safari because, like all of us, he wondered what it would be like to shoot a person, which is classic psychopath. <laughs> Plus... He always gives my television documentaries very bad reviews, which is classic psychopath. Um, I actually um, bumped into A.A. Gill quite recently at an award ceremony, and he came bounding over to me and said, I hear I'm in your book about psychopaths. Don't worry, I would never sue another journalist. So I said, you know how you wrote that column about how you'd shot a baboon on safari, because like all of us, you wondered what it'd be like to shoot a person. I said, it's not all of us. It's not a normal thing to think, it's just you. So he said, oh, well, you don't hunt, so you wouldn't understand. So I said, I sell more books than you do. So I won. I won psychopathically. Uh, anyway, but then Robert Hare, the man who, who taught me how to spot psychopaths, I should say he hates me paraphrasing what he does in that way, um, said that what you need to do with your powers uh, is tell the story of corporate psychopathy. He said, this is the biggest story in the world, corporate psychopathy, and nobody's thinking about it. He said, why the wars? Why the economic injustice? Corporate psychopaths, because capitalism, at its most re remorseless, rewards psychopathic character traits, the lack of empathy, the lack of remorse. 
he said, you should get yourself some corporate psychopaths to interview. So I thought I'd give it a try. So I, uh, the first thing I did was I wrote to Bernie Madoff to say, and I said, can I come and interview you in prison to find out if you're a psychopath? And he didn't write back. Uh, so I changed tack. I wrote to a famous um, asset stripper called Chainsaw Al Dunlap. Um, Al Dunlap was famous for going into a failing business and he would shut down 30% of the factories, close, you know, fire 30% of the workforce, and he'd always do it with a joke. So one time somebody said to him, I've just bought myself a new car, and he said, you may have a new car, but I tell you what, you don't have a job. Uh, he was considered such a quintessential psychopathic boss, in fact, that Fast Company magazine, in their list of 50 worst corporate psychopaths of all time, put him in the list, and he was the only person in the list who was still alive. Uh, so I wrote to Al Dunlap, and I changed tack, and I said, I believe that you may have a very special brain anomaly that makes you fearless and interested in the predatory spirit. Can I come and interview you about your special brain anomaly? And he said, come on over. So I went over to his house, remembering, by the way, that one of the items on the psychopath checklist is cunning manipulative. Uh, so I turned up at his house, which was filled with sculptures and paintings of predatory animals. Here's Al. Uh, so he was giving me a tour of his uh, garden. He said, over there, you've got sculptures of lions and tigers and panthers. And uh, he was saying this to me in a less effeminate way. Uh, <laughs> I said, it's like Midas and the Queen of Narnia flew over a particularly fierce zoo and transformed everything into stone and then deposited everything here. And he said, what? And I said, nothing. <laughs> and I said, it was just a, a jumble of words that became confused in my mouth. And he said, oh, okay. So then we went into his kitchen and it was Al, his wife Judy, and his bodyguard Sean. And I said, uh, you know how I said in my email that you may have a very special brain anomaly uh, that makes you fearless. And he said, yeah, it's an amazing theory. It's like Star Trek. You're going where no man has gone before. And I said, well, <clears throat> uh, some psychologists would say that this makes you <laughs> and he said, what? And I said, a, a, a psychopath. And in fact, I have in my pocket a list, a checklist of psychopathic character traits. Can I go through it with you? And I think what saved me is that Al Dunlap, like all of us, loves nothing more than a mental health checklist. So he said, OK. So I, I, I got it out. And I said, item one, grandiose sense of self-worth which would have been a hard one for him to deny because we were standing underneath a giant oil painting of himself. <laughs> and he said, well, you've got to believe in you. Uh, I said, manipulative. He said, that's leadership. And so he went down the, the checklist, redefining most of the items as business positives. Uh, shallow affect and inability to experience a range of emotions, he said. Who wants to be weighed down by some stupid emotions? Uh, and so on. So I did notice, though, something happening to me the day that I was at Al Dunlap's house, which was that every time he said something that wasn't psychopathic, I thought, well, that's OK. I won't put that in my book. So he said no to many short-term marital relationships. He's only been married twice. Admittedly, his first marriage ended when he threatened his first wife with a knife and said he always wondered what human flesh tasted like. Um, <laughs> but his second marriage has lasted 41 years. Uh, he said no to juvenile delinquency. He got accepted into West Point, and he said they don't let delinquents into West Point. Um, so whenever he said those things, I thought, well, that's OK. I won't put that in my book. And then I, I, I realized that learning how to become a psychopath spotter had kind of turned me a little bit psychopathic in my desire to shove this man, Al Dunlap, into a box marked psychopath. I was like determined to 
to define him by his outermost edges. And when I got back to London, I had dinner with a friend of mine, a documentary maker, Adam Curtis, and he said, it's what we all do, isn't it? He said, as journalists, we go around the world with our notepads in our hands, and we wait for the gems. And the gems are always the outermost aspects of that person's personality. And then we stitch together the gems like medieval tapestry makers, and we leave all the ordinary stuff on the floor. And we all know that what we do is odd, but none of us like to talk about it. And I think that's true. I think that's what we all do as journalists. And, uh, you know, after that, I met a woman who was a, a guest booker for the kind of Jerry Springer-type shows where, you know, families would all go on TV and all yell at each other. And her name was Charlotte. And, in fact, she told me that she had a secret trick that she would utilize when deciding which guests to book. And her secret trick was that she would ask them what medication they were on. And if it was a medication, she said, that was scary-sounding, like lithium, she said, you don't want them on the show, because what you don't want is them to go on the show and then go off and kill themselves. Uh, she said, but if it was a medication that implied a kind of fun-sounding mental illness, like Prozac, she said, that's perfect. That shows they're angry and upset. They're just the right sort of mad. She said, you're not looking for actual exploitation. You're looking for smoke and mirrors exploitation because we want to watch people on television who are just a bit crazier than we are, so we don't feel quite so crazy, and it's entertaining for us, and also we don't feel like we're exploiting them. So Prozac is the right sort of mental illness to be entertaining for our benefit on daytime television. Not that it always works, by the way. She said one time they were doing a show called My Boyfriend is Too Vain. And so they had the vain boyfriend on the show, and they were, like, pushing him, you know, the whole Charles Atlas, and everybody was laughing. And then after the show, he phoned her up, and while he was on the phone to her, he cut open his wrists. So the method didn't always work. Um, anyway, um, I think this um, labeling culture is kind of out of control. And I think especially here in, in Boston, in fact, there's been some terrible scandals. Um, the children, there's a, there's a doctor at a hospital in Boston who came up with a, with, a, with a new diagnosis called childhood bipolar disorder, which meant that children as young as two and three were getting labeled bipolar because they were scoring high on the bipolar checklist, which meant, you know, because they had temper tantrums, they would go to the doctor with temper tantrums and the doctor would diagnose them as bipolar. And so they were put on antipsychotic medication. And one little girl from Boston, a girl called Rebecca Riley, committed, um, would, died of an overdose of her antipsychotic medication. She was labeled bipolar at the age of two and she died at the age of four. And I would go around the world giving talks about this stuff, about how wrong it is to, to, to rush to labeling people, to define people by their outermost edges. And, and everybody would agree with me that it was bad. Like everything I've just said, I think we could all agree, is bad, right? And then we would all go home and we would do exactly the same thing on social media. We would diagnose people by the worst tweet that they ever wrote. We would label people, we'd, we'd cast them out. And I think the kind of hypocrisy of that started to really um, rankle with me. And so I really wanted to write a book about, you know, why we had become the people abusing our power now. And so I wrote this new book, So You've Been Publicly Shamed. And I, and I think in the early days of social media, it was, it was a great place. It was like a place of radical de-shaming. People would admit hitherto shameful secrets to themselves, and other people would say, oh, my God, I'm exactly the same. And, you know, ask any shame researcher, ask Brene Brown or any psychiatrist, and, and they would agree that this is a, this is a healing thing. You know, if, if, when you share shame, when you connect, when you admit these shameful secrets about themselves, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And in the early days of Twitter, it was like a place of incredible destigmatizing, de-shaming. It was a place of curiosity. There was even a phrase back then in the early days of Twitter, Facebook is where you lie to your friends. Twitter is where you tell the truth to strangers. And it was a place where voiceless people could have a voice. 
And for me, it was great, you know, having honest and funny conversations with like-minded people got me through real problems that were happening in my actual house. But after a while, it began to mutate, and instead of it becoming a place of radical de-shaming, it was almost like the hunt was on for people's shameful secrets. And I think what happened was it started from a good place. You know, voiceless people realized that they had a voice and it, would be, and it was powerful and eloquent. And so if a powerful person transgressed, if a person was seen to be misusing their privilege, we could get them. We could hit them with a weapon that we understood and they didn't, a social media shaming. And so if a columnist wrote something racist or homophobic, we could, we could hit them with this weapon and it would work. And to this day, great things happen because of social justice on social media. You only have to look at what's happening with the refugee crisis at the moment. You know, the, 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 the power we have on social media is actually changing policy. Uh, David Cameron is, is now allowing refugees into, into my country, which I think he, he wouldn't have done if there hadn't been such a social media campaign. So in many ways, it's, you know, social justice on social media is, is a great thing. But I think the problem was we fell in love with getting people who were misusing their privilege so much that a day without a shaming felt like a weird and empty day, like a day when there wasn't somebody who had misused their privilege that we could get, felt like a day picking fingernails or treading water. And into this rather ferocious atmosphere stumbled a woman that I want to tell you about called Justine Sacco. Uh, in my book, I, I, I say that Justine was like a social media Sally Bowles, like flighty and decadent and unaware that serious politics were looming. In Cabaret, Sally Bowles says, politics? But what has that got to do with us? So Justine had 170 Twitter followers and she'd tweet little acerbic jokes to them, like this one on a plane from New York to London. So Justine chuckled to herself and pressed send and got no replies and felt that sad feeling that we all feel when the internet doesn't congratulate us for being funny. <laughs> sort of think, what's the point? Like we surround ourselves with people who feel the same way we do and we approve each other. So when you're not congratulated for being funny, it's like the whole thing crumbles. Anyway, Justine got to... Heathrow Airport, where she had a little stopover before her final leg to Cape Town. And she thought up another funny little acerbic joke and tweeted it to her 170 Twitter followers. So she chuckled to herself, pressed send, got on the plane, turned off her phone, slept, woke up with that kind of icky feeling that we have when we've been asleep on a plane. Turned on her phone, and straight away there was a text from somebody she hadn't spoken to since high school that said, I am so sorry to see what's happening to you now. And then there was another text from my best friend, Hannah, that said, you need to call me immediately. You are the worldwide number one trending topic on Twitter. So what had happened while Justine slept was that one of her 170 followers had um, sent the joke to a Gorka journalist called Sam Biddle, and he retweeted it to his 15,000 followers, and that's how it began. Later, I asked Sam Biddle how it would have felt to have started the onslaught against Justine, and he said it felt delicious. And then he said, but I'm sure she's fine but she wasn't fine. By the way, that phrase, I'm sure she's fine, it's what we all want to do. It's because we want to destroy people but not feel bad about it. That's why we're constantly calling other people sociopaths on Twitter, that kind of dehumanizing term. We want to destroy people but not feel bad about it. And of course, Justine wasn't fine because while she was asleep, Twitter took control of her life and dismantled it piece by piece. First, there were the philanthropists, Then came the beyond horrified. 
Was anybody on Twitter that night? A few of you. So uh, presumably Justine's tweet overwhelmed your timeline like it did mine. I mean, I, I, I felt that night what everybody else was thinking on Twitter, which was, uh, wow, somebody's fucked. And I, <laughs> and I sat up in bed and propped the pillow behind my head. And, <laughs> and then I thought, I'm not sure that that joke was intended to be racist. Maybe instead of gleefully flaunting her privilege, she was mocking the gleeful flaunting of privilege. There is a comedy tradition of this, like South Park and Colbert and Randy Newman. There's a Randy Newman song I love called I Love LA with the lyrics, look at those mountains, look at those trees, look at that bum over there, man, he's down on his knees. You know, what Randy Newman's doing in that lyric is he's acknowledging his own privilege and, and self-reflexively mocking it. Maybe that's what Justine was doing. Um, maybe Justine's cry was just not being as good at it as Randy Newman. And in fact, when I met Justine a couple of weeks later, she walked into a bar just pale. She told me she'd been crying out her body weight and she was just crushed. And, and um, to this day, I'm the only journalist she's ever spoken to about this. She said it was just too harrowing to talk about it. And she was wearing the business clothes of her former life. She'd been fired, of course, because social media demanded her firing. Um, and she was wearing her business clothes because she was due into work that evening to clean out her desk. But as she walked in, just looking pale and wearing her business clothes, it reminded me of, you know, of a zombie from Night of the Living Dead. And I asked her to explain the joke to me, and she said, living in America puts us in a bit of a bubble when it comes to what is going on in the third world. I was making fun of that bubble. And I think, you know what, I think a lot of people realize that, that, you know, realize that was the intention of her joke. But I think a lot of people decided to just destroy her anyway. Um, you know, a, a woman called Helen Lewis reviewed my book for the New Statesman in England, and she wrote that she was on Twitter that night, and she tweeted, I'm not sure that that joke was intended to be racist, and she said straight away she got a fury of tweets along the lines of, well, you're just a privileged bitch too. And so to her shame, she wrote, she shut up and just watched as Justine's life got dismantled. It began to get darker. And then came the calls for her to be fired. Thousands of people around the world decided it was their duty to get Justine fired. Corporations got involved, hoping to sell their products on the back of Justine's annihilation. You know, a lot of people were making good money out of Justine's destruction that night. Usually Justine's name was Googled 40 times a month, but that night and for the couple of nights afterwards, her name was Googled 1,220,000 times, which means, as one internet economist told me, Google made somewhere between $120,000 and $468,000 out of Justine's annihilation. Whereas those of us doing the actual destroying, we got nothing. We were like unpaid shaming interns for Google and Twitter. <laughs> then came the trolls. Somebody else wrote, somebody HIV positive should rape this bitch and then we'll find out if her skin color protects her from AIDS. And nobody went after that person. That person got a free pass. It's like our shaming brains are so primitive, we could only handle destroying one person a night. It was too complicated for us to also destroy somebody who was inappropriately destroying Justine. On Twitter that night, we were like toddlers crawling towards a gun. You demented bitch. Retarded racist bitch. And then Justine's employers got involved. And that's when the anger turned to excitement. Hipsters. Justine united a lot of disparate groups that night, from hipsters to philanthropists to social justice people to rape the bitch.
What we had was a delightful narrative arc. We knew something that Justine didn't know, which was that her life was being destroyed while she slept. And that was hilarious to us. In fact, her, her, Justine's inability to explain her joke became a huge part of the hilarity that night. Could you think of anything less judicial than this? You know, in actual courts, there's like textbooks with like thousands of years of, um, of legal precedents. It's like year zero on Twitter right now when it comes to justice. Somebody worked out exactly which plane she was on, and so they linked to a flight tracker website. A hashtag started trending worldwide. Hashtag, has Justine landed yet? And guess what? Yes, there was. And if you want to know what it looks like to have just discovered that you've been destroyed by tens of thousands of people, not crazy trolls, but delightful people like us for a misconstrued liberal joke, it looks like this. So why did we do it? I think some people were genuinely upset but I think for other people, it's because Twitter is basically a mutual approval machine. We surround ourselves with people who feel the same way we do, and we approve each other, and that's a really good feeling. And if somebody gets in the way of that good feeling, we yell them out. And you know what that is the opposite of? I know a lot of tech utopians, there'll be a lot of tech utopians in this room who see social media as a new form of democracy. But when you surround yourself with people who feel exactly the same way you do and then scream out anybody who disagrees, that's actually the opposite of democracy. We wanted to show people that we cared about people dying of AIDS in Africa. Our desire to be seen to be compassionate is what led us to commit this profoundly uncompassionate act of tearing apart a woman while she was asleep on the plane. I actually said that to Brene Brown backstage, and she said, that's bullshit. It didn't come from a place of compassion. People were just being dicks. Or people were coming from a place of incredible pain themselves, and all we can think to do is slap shame onto shame like some dodgy builder covering cracks. I met a prison psychiatrist called James Gilligan, by the way, who um, he would deal with mass murderers inside prisons in Massachusetts. Um, he was a Harvard psychiatrist. And, and he would, people said to him, you don't want to go into prison. They're just psychopaths. They're just going to try and manipulate you to try and get a reduced sentence. But he went into prisons anyway to try and work out why there was so much prison violence. And... Um, he came to the conclusion that actually these men he was talking to were harboring a central secret. And that central secret was that they felt ashamed, deeply, profoundly ashamed. As children, they were beaten, starved, suffocated, raped by their parents. They were pimped out by their mothers. And they said that they all had died themselves before they started to kill other people. And it was because they just felt a numbness inside. Because too much shame, something clicks off and you're just numb. It's like instead of having flesh and blood, you have veins and cords. One person said he felt like his body was full of straw. Another person told Gilligan that uh, he felt like food that was decomposing. And Gilligan's conclusion was that all violence, certainly the sort of violence of the men that he was dealing with, all violence, he wrote, was an attempt to replace shame with self-esteem. And I think when Brene Brown said that the people who destroyed Justine were themselves coming from a place of shame and pain, I think she was talking about the same kind of thing that James Gilligan was talking about. But you know what? Ask most people why they destroyed Justine Sacco, and they would say... It was social justice. We were getting her because she had misused her privilege. But of course, as Megan O'Geeblin wrote about my book in the Boston Review, this isn't social justice. What this is, is a cathartic alternative to social justice. What this is, is Rosa Parks' light. For the past three years, I've been going around the world meeting people like Justine Sacco. And believe me, there's a lot of people like Justine Sacco. There's more every day. In fact, just today, 
um, there's been another suicide because of the Ashley Madison hack. Um, we want to think those people are fine, but they're not fine. The people I met were mangled. They talked to me about depression and anxiety and insomnia and suicidal thoughts. One woman I talked to, a Massachusetts woman, who also told a joke that landed badly. She stayed home for a year and a half because of her anxiety and depression. She read every single tweet, and the tweets just kind of snaked their way into her brain. And before that, she worked with adults with learning difficulties, and she was apparently very good at her job. Justine was fired, of course, because social media demanded it, but it was worse than that. She was losing herself. She was waking up in the middle of the night, forgetting who she was. Word got around that she was the daughter of the mining billionaire, Desmond Sacco. And I thought that was true about Justine, right up until I met her, and I asked her about her billionaire father, and she said, my dad sells carpets. See, we had to fictionalize Justine Sacco to not feel so bad about what she did. Anyway, I put all of this in my book about public shaming, and in the last couple of weeks, I, I've, I've written a new chapter for the paperback about what happened after my book came out, and I want to unveil a couple of pages of it right now. Last Christmas, my US publisher sent me a box of Christmas cookies with a card that read, get some rest, 2015 is going to be a bumpy year. I emailed him back to ask him what he meant. He replied that some people were going to hate my book. Oh, nobody's going to hate it, I thought. How could they? I'm right. <laughs> In February, the New York Times magazine published my story about Justine Sacco. Condemnation began hes hesitantly at first, a little uncertain, like a consensus waiting to form. Somebody wrote, the article did nothing but bring her back into the spotlight when we'd all moved on. Poor thing. Her dad's a billionaire, someone replied. I'm not too worried about her. That tweet didn't ruin her life, somebody added. Justine Sacco has a new job. Give me a break already. After a year, I thought when I read that one, Justine got a new job after a year. Nice people like us had effectively sentenced Justine to a year's punishment for the crime of some poor phraseology in a tweet, as if some clunky wording had been a clue to her secret inner evil. And the fact that she doggedly managed to pull things back together after a year was now being used as evidence that the shaming had been no big deal to begin with. I remembered a time that I was on a beach in Scotland and a flock of terns singled me out. They circled above me for a while and then began to dive bomb, pecking at my head. I ran back to the road, shaking and shrieking and waving my arms in the air. You're probably too close to their eggs, my wife Elaine <laughs> shouted after me. You should be aware of their nests. I have no idea where their nests are, I yelled back. I've got to say, my wife Elaine and I have a lot of fights. Quite recently, I was at a party, a dinner party, and as I turned up, the host said to me, would you like some potato chips? And I said, no, thank you. I'm going to have cereal when I get home. And um, out of the corner of my eye, I saw my wife just mouthing something urgently at me. And I was like, what? And she went, be more general. <laughs> this early tentative disapproval felt like the turns circling, and then the dive bombing began. After reading that excerpt from his book, I think it's safe to say that John Ronson is a fucking racist. <laughs> An opinion was beginning to form and feed off itself that I'd written an attack on social justice, a defense of white privilege. In coming out against online shaming, I was silencing marginalized voices, because online shaming is the only recourse of the marginalized, whereas the world automatically allows people like Justine to succeed. But I just couldn't see how Justine's shaming made anything better, given that her joke was intended to mock racism. What happened to Justine struck me as just another terrible thing happening in the world. I wrote about Justine not because I identified with her, although I did, but because I identified with the people who tore her apart. I consider myself a social justice person. 
It was my people abusing our power. I decided to try and encourage those people to read the book, and so I tweeted, by the way, the Justine Sacco story in the New York Times isn't a standalone article, it's an extract from a book. Oh, someone wrote, now Ronson's saying it's an extract from a book. What did that mean? It was always an extract from a book. <laughs> did you think I ran home and quickly wrote a book? <laughs> I wish it was that easy. But anything I said in that moment, I realized, would just be more evidence for the prosecution. And so I went back to being silent. Why isn't John Ronson replying to any of us, someone wrote. Because John Ronson only replies to men, someone said. <laughs> I wanted to say to them, honestly, I'm like a eunuch from Game of Thrones. You really don't need to worry about me in that regard. <laughs> I liked it when people went for me in ridiculous ways, because, I, because when I recounted those comments to other people, they made me look good. I didn't regret writing Justine's story. I was basically being told, it's fine to write about those wronged people, but don't write about that wronged person over there, because it makes us look bad. But a wronged person is a wronged person, even when they're an unfashionable wronged person. A train crashed in Philadelphia. Passenger cars were ripped apart. Eight people died, and 200 more were hospitalized. <clears throat> a survivor emerged from the wreckage, and she tweeted, You know, in the early days of Twitter, when it was a place of empathy and curiosity, I think people would have said, oh my God, are you okay? What was it like? What happened? What can you tell me? But that's not how Twitter responded. This is how Twitter responded. Some spoiled asshole is whining about her violin being on that Amtrak that derailed. People died on that train, and she's an idiot. I hope the violin is crushed, and I hope someone picks it up and smacks it against the train, and fuck that little bitch and her goddamn violin. I would slap the fucking taste out of her mouth if she was in reach. You're a little asshole. And then after she deleted her Twitter account. Too bad she's a coward and deleted her account. How will her violin ever be returned? And I hope you get your violin back from under the bleeding people. And I hope it is destroyed. Your violin can be replaced. The dead are gone forever. And self-absorbed cunt. And I won't be cutting her any slack. What a sickening skank. I hope her life is exactly what a nasty bitch deserves. And eight passengers dead, but she lives. No justice in the world, and entitlement at its finest. Like Justine, she was being shamed because she was perceived to have misused her privilege. And of course, the misuse of privilege is a much better thing to get people for than the stuff we used to get people for, like having children out of wedlock. But the fact was, a great number of people who hadn't just been in a train crash were now accusing a woman who had just been in a train crash of being privileged. The phrase misuse of privilege was becoming a free pass to tear apart pretty much anybody we chose to. It was becoming a devalued term, and it was making us lose our capacity for empathy and for distinguishing between serious and unserious transgressions. I visited a TV studio in New York to film a video about the book. There was a doctor on before me filming her own video. What's your book about, she asked me. Online shaming. I said, oh, did you read the piece in the New York Times? She said, I wrote it, I said. Oh, you must be so happy, she said. Actually, I'm not, I said. Why not, she said. Because people are calling me a racist, I said. So what do you want, she said. Xanax, I said. <laughs> she got out her pad and wrote me a prescription for 60 Xanax. After that, I was no longer anxious but I felt groggy. I had to weigh up whether to feel groggy or anxious. By the way, when I got home and told um, my family that story, my son said, you asked for Xanax, you should have asked for Oxycontin. <laughs> As a father, that doesn't fill me with joy. <laughs> anyway, I mentioned all of this to the comedian Joe Rogan, and he replied, welcome to America, that's our dilemma, groggy or anxious. Yesterday on the train, by the way, I, I just wrote a couple of pages, which I, which I 
I, you know, I know that this is a very special sort of event, and so I just wrote a, a couple of pages, which I want to read. I said, I know there's a lot of business leaders and human resources people here, and I understand why you'd want to fire the Justine Sackos in your midst. When social media demands a firing, the easy thing to do is frantically capitulate, because social media can be terrifying, and you don't want to get hurt too. And in many ways, this leveling of the playing field is great. A few weeks ago, I was visiting a friend in hospital. She has cystic fibrosis. Just before I arrived, her lung had collapsed, and she was in the waiting room, failing to get a bed. She sent out a tweet saying as much, and a bed miraculously became available. The instant capitulation made the hospital look good, and my friend got the bed she needed. And as long as some poor schmuck without a Twitter account wasn't kicked out into the corridor, which I assume didn't happen, all was well. But when it comes to the public shaming of private individuals who don't deserve it, it feels like social media is like the school bully, and corporations and the mainstream media are like the spineless nerdy kids sucking up to it. So I want to end with this. When you see an unfair or an, un or an ambiguous shaming unfold, when one of your employees has done something stupid and out of character, I urge you not to throw them under the bus, because I think the tide is beginning to turn. Late last April, for example, the Houston Rockets played their interstate rivals, the Dallas Mavericks, in the first round of the NBA playoffs. Late in the game, the official Houston Rockets Twitter account tweeted an emoji of a gun shooting a horse with the comment, shh, just close your eyes, it will all be over soon. As Ben Dreyfus later wrote in Mother Jones, the internet being the stupid place that it is, a thousand crybabies immediately began to cry. Oh, pray for the emoji horse. How dare the stupid Twitter account joke about horse slaughter? Wah, wah, wah. The internet is a place where people cry about bullshit. If outrage is a currency, and it is, then the online market is drowning in counterfeits. People like to feign outrage because it allows them to demonstrate their humanity and show the world that they feel things strongly. And people like to sleep with people who feel things strongly. After the game, the Rockets fired their social media manager, Chad Shanks, and a thousand newspaper editorials finally saw sense and took the side of the unfairly fired employee. And so, unpleasant as it will surely be for you, and I say that from personal knowledge, I urge you to speak up on behalf of the shamed person. A babble of opposing voices, that's democracy. The great thing about social media was how it gave a voice to voiceless people. Let's not turn it into a world where the smartest way to survive is to go back to being voiceless. Thank you.